Well, good morning, Oakstone. Actually, I watch some of those videos. It's amazing how many people say good morning. <laughs> you know, we come from, uh, from, from out of state, a lot of us, so I apologize. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, what a blessing to be here. It's been uh, a, a little bit, probably over two years since I've been to Oakstone. I think we were in a different room last time. I don't remember carpet, but uh, what a blessing. Seems that there's been some growth here in the body, and uh, what an encouragement to see new faces and to know um, where the beginnings of this fellowship started, right? Just, just about three years ago or so, how, how it all came about. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up in prayer and ask that the Lord will bless the words of my mouth and bless uh, everyone's ears to hear whatever it is that he has uh, for his church to hear today. Father, I ask that you uh, pour your spirit upon me, Father. I am just a vessel to be used by you for your glory. And I do thank you, Father, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come here and speak to your people and uh, share whatever it is that's on your heart, Father. I ask that you anoint my tongue, Father, and that what comes from me will not be of me, but, Father, that I may be a vessel who you can use today to speak to those who have needs, Father, needs that you know of, that no one else does. We give you all glory, honor, and praise, and we ask for your blessing on this Sabbath, Father, as we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So I wasn't planning on using the whiteboard, but since it's here, <laughs> it's the first time for me. I'd like to talk to you guys today. about discipline. Now, depending on where you come from, depending on your upbringing, that may or may not have a, a different meaning to you, right? <laughs> I had a stepdad who was a, who was a drill sergeant in the Marine Corps. And so for me, discipline meant the rod of correction, right? It meant you do something wrong, you're going to get your butt whooped. Good. But... For other people, discipline doesn't mean you're going to get a beating or chastisement, right? Discipline is something that's more of an art. It's something that maybe you perfect uh, a skill, okay? I was talking to this young man. He was saying, uh, Jay, uh, Jackson over here, and he, he might want to, he's looking to maybe get into the trades. So when you get into a trade, it's a discipline. It's something that you you're going to do for a long time, and you're going to learn things over and over again until they become second nature to you, right? I myself was an electrician for 20 years. I started uh, 20 years ago, sold my company this year when we moved to Tennessee, but it was 20 years of disciplined work in a field, and God used it, and he blessed our family through it, and I provided for my wife and my two children. And so that was a discipline that had a benefit in our life. And so I'd like to ask the question, who in here feels in general that you are a disciplined person? So I've got a couple like so-sos, and I probably see about six or seven hands. So that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm so-so. I can be disciplined, right? It just depends on how I feel about what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. So... I know you probably wouldn't think this, but about 20 years ago, when I got married, I was actually in pretty good shape. I was about 205 pounds, very, very little body fat, and uh, why? Because at the age of 16 years old, I said, I'm tired of being a skinny little twerp, right? After I went through my, my fat stages as a 12-year-old, 12 to 16, I lost all kinds of weight, but now I was too skinny. I was a rail. I shot up. I was six foot, and I was about a buck sixty soaking wet. So I decided to start the discipline of, of working out, and I wanted to build my body to feel better about myself, and I did that. And for about four years, I worked out religiously. At first, it was six days a week, you know, and then it went down about five days a week, but I would spend two or three hours a day in the gym, and I learned everything I could about bodybuilding, about health, about fitness, about being in shape, and it was my discipline. I was very disciplined, and I reaped the rewards of that. Today, I stand about 40 pounds heavier than I was. 
when I got married. And it's funny because this year we moved from California to Tennessee. And we had some friends in California that said, you know, the food out there is not like the food over here. It's that good old home cooking, fried, everything, right? And, uh, and so we knew going to Tennessee, if we don't implement some new disciplines in our life, that we're probably going to gain some weight, <laughs> right? So my wife and I made a commitment, okay, we're going to exercise, and we're going to eat better, and we're not going to go out to eat all the time because we know it's going to be hard to find good food. But in reality, what happened? I get to Tennessee, and after being there for about three weeks, our friends from California, I'm going to go ahead and rat them out. It was, it was Stephanie Liesenfeld. <laughs> She's really good friends with my wife, but she says, so Lisa, how, how are you and William doing on your commitment? And Lisa's like, well, not so good. I'm almost at my heaviest. And she's like, what about William? So my wife asks me. I get on the scale. I'm like, honey, I hit my peak. I hit my peak. I was eight pounds heavier than my highest weight within three weeks of moving to Tennessee. So I told my wife, but it's all muscle. It's all muscle because I, I went for a bike ride with my daughter and that worked out my legs, you know, and I did some push-ups. So, you know, but the reality is we are called to be a disciplined people. I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. In the gospel of Matthew, as many other gospels, um, Jesus gives what is called the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, and in verse 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So I want you guys to notice something here. It's called the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission to go into all the, all the earth, all the world, and to make disciples. Now, I want you to think about that word disciple. What is a discipline and what is a disciple? To be a disciple, go ahead. A student, yeah, exactly. The definition of a disciple is a learner. It means you're a learner, right? But is it okay to just learn? It's not okay to just learn unless you actually put into practice what you're learning. And so a true disciple is not just somebody who sits in the classroom and listens to the instruction and hears the words and knows how to answer the question, right? A disciple is somebody who actually practices the art of what they're learning. So here's another interesting uh, statistic that I'd like to share with you guys. And this comes from, uh, it's, it's a Wikipedia, but it's a list of ethnic groups in the United States based by household income, okay? Now, this is something that my wife brought to my attention. I was totally unaware of it, but my wife is Hispanic, for those of you who do not know, okay? And so in this list of ethnic groups who are organized by, by household income, Guess who ranked at the top of the list in the United States of America? It was the Asian cultures, okay, the Asian race. And so, you know, I always thought, you know, these, these guys are educated, they go to school. I mean, they, they have a much more extensive educational program than we do here in the United States. And so I always attributed their success to their education. But my wife was, was, was watching this, uh, this speaker, and he was of Asian descent, and he says, you know, everybody thinks that the Asians are so successful because we're smarter, because we're more intelligent, because we go to school. He said, but it's not true. What makes us stand apart is that we are a very disciplined people. We're very disciplined. 
So in contrast to that, you have the, the average Asian, according to the Wikipedia, is 85,000 a year. The average white American is $65,000 a year in income. And then my wife, the Hispanic, the average Hispanic is 55,000 a year. So, and nothing, not, not to say that you can't be a Hispanic and be very wealthy and very successful. You absolutely can. My father-in-law is first generation to this country. And, uh, and he, is, he is a very, uh, he has no need of money, let's put it that way. He did very well for himself here. But the idea is discipline. Now, I'm speaking to you about worldly wealth. I'm speaking to you about the things of this world. And if discipline can get you success in this world, what about the godly disciplines? What about the godly disciplines? What about the teachings of Christ? And so I want you to think about your life, and I want you to think about the choices that you make, the things that you've heard, the things that many times Time after time, Sabbath after Sabbath, people have stood up here and they've delivered a message and they've spoken words of life. Have you put them into practice? Have I been practicing the teachings of the one I claim to be a disciple of? Because we all know that in James, he says that we are to be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving ourselves. Did you know that if you hear the word, but you're not doing it, you're deceiving yourself? And so you have to ask, what, it, what might that deception be? Could it be that I think I'm a disciple, but I'm not? Because a disciple is somebody who hears and does. And I look at my life, and I look at times where I've fallen short, and we all fall short. But that's where the grace of God comes in, right? That if we, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so, to take some time to examine and, and to say, well, what is it to be a disciple? What is it to make a disciple? So, I'd like to ask um, a consensus here. What, what does it mean to make a disciple? What does that look like in, in our culture? In the United States, how, how do we go about making disciples here? Is it to invite them to church? Is that the making of a disciple? Maybe. Right? Maybe. Once they get here, are you pouring into them? Right? Are you taking anyone under your wing? So I, I want to give you a, just a broad overview of what it might look for us in America to be making disciples. Right? Because not many of us are going to Africa or, you know, Zimbabwe to go out and to make disciples. So about, uh, about two years ago, in California, I was running a company, and this young man came to work for me, and he was from Wisconsin. And uh, kind of new to the California culture, but he was looking for a job, and he was looking to make a way for himself and his family. So I hired him, and he comes to work for me, and, and uh, he, was, he, he knew of God, right? He was from the, from the Rust Belt, and he kind of grew up in the church, and his mom was a, you know, a good churchgoer and whatnot. But he was not really a godly man, but he said, yeah, I believe in Jesus and this and that. So he comes to work for me. And the first day of work, he's over there, and I could tell he's getting really frustrated because he's trying to impress the boss. And he's, he's cursing, you know, he's got, a, he's got a foul mouth, and he's GD this and GD that, you know, and he doesn't know I hear him. But I walk over and I say, and he doesn't know I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't advertise that on my business cards. I let my life profess who I am. So I walk over and I say, hey, Tom, you know, if you ask him to bless it, it'll probably turn out a little bit better for you. <laughs> and he just kind of looks up at me and he's like, oh, I never really thought of it like that. 
I said, well, you should. You're asking God to damn something that you're working on. He'll do it, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, he, his eyes lit up. It gave him a new perspective. And, oh, I see you're a God-fearing man. I said, yes, I am. From that day forward, I began to take the time to mentor him. And when I would show up to work, I would take every opportunity that I could to minister to him the teachings of Jesus and to make a disciple out of him. I remember he was complaining to me about this hammer that he bought, right? And he was saying, well, it's Home Depot. I'm just going to return it. I'm going to get my money back. I keep them for two or three years, and I return them, and I get a brand new one. And I said, that's not right. Oh, well, why not? I said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I said, how would you like to be the manufacturer of the hammer? And every three years, somebody comes and turns it in and tries to get a new one from you. Well, but they're a big corporation. This is corporate America. And I said, Tom, it, let me ask you this. How hard would it be for you to make that hammer yourself? Are you going to go cut the tree down from the woods? Are you going to... Are you going to mine the iron from the earth and smelt it down? Are you going to forge the steel into the shape? You should look a little bit differently about this, right? Don't do that. So about, about two months ago, I get a phone call from Tom. He, he's moved back to Wisconsin since then. One of the things I told him to do, I said, look, it's easy. Start reading the Bible every day. This is how, this is how you start to follow the Lord. Start reading the word. And I, and I said him on the Proverbs. And I said, just read the Proverbs. They're going to give you life wisdom. So he began reading the Proverbs every day. He began praying with his wife. We actually prayed for them that his wife would get pregnant because she wasn't able to, to have a baby. She wasn't able to get pregnant. And when she did, then the doctors told him, oh, no, there's complications. And so he came to us. And my wife and I prayed for him. We said, Tom, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be all right. You just trust in God because we prayed for this child and God's going to bless it. They had that baby and that baby is as healthy as can be. So Tom calls me a few days ago and, uh, and he says, William, I, I've got a little bit of a dilemma. I said, okay, what is it? Well, I ordered some ammunition online for my guns and, you know, the stuff's really scarce and hard to come by right now and it's really expensive and, you know, that's not the problem. He's like... They double shipped my order. And I said, oh, wow. He's like, and it wasn't a small sum. He's like, it was like $1,500 worth of ammo. I said, wow, Tom. Okay. He's like, so I'm just calling you to see what you think I should do. <laughs> I said, well, Tom, what do you think is the right thing to do? Well, I probably should tell him. I said, yeah. I said, you know what, Tom? The reality is God is going to bless you for making the sacrifice and doing the right thing. Like, it's hard. It's hard to make that decision, right? But I said, God is going to bless you for doing the right thing. I said, you never know what's going to come down the road if you make the choice now not to do the right thing, you will reap the consequences. And who knows what that's going to look like. And he was a little upset. Oh, I knew you were going to say that if I called you. You know, I, I knew that's what you're going to say, but I had to hear it anyways. I said, okay. So I, I called him before I came and I said, hey, Tom, how did that go? Did you ever contact them? And he says, I did. I, I called him and, and left a message and I shot him an email and I haven't heard back from him. And I hope I don't. <laughs> and I said, well, if you don't, as long as you told him, your conscience is clear. So what does it mean to make disciples? You see, it's, it's that simple. You don't necessarily have to go to Zimbabwe. There are enough people right here in our own backyard. There are enough people within our own congregation who just need to see the Word of God lived out in their life. Right? Right? And in the workplace, I think that this might be one of the key places where you, where you practice this. Because how often do we take that light that is supposed to be set up on a hill and we put it under a bushel and we don't give light 
to those who are around us. So turn with me over to uh, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and beginning in verse 31, Mark 8, 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man would suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the world but forfeit his soul? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does it mean to deny yourself and to take up your cross and to follow Jesus? When I was 19 years old, I sold everything I had, and I said, Lord, I'm all yours. I'm committed. I sold my truck. I sold my CDs, got rid of all my music, and I used the money, and I went on a missions trip to Africa, and I thought, I'm going to be a missionary for the Lord. I'm just going to go wherever he sends me, and in Africa, I almost died. After being there for about three weeks, I literally ended up in the hospital on my deathbed with IVs in my arms. They didn't know what I had. Still to this day, we don't know what I had. But I was in the hospital for seven days. And I remember being there saying, Lord, this isn't how it was supposed to look. This isn't what I meant when I said, I'm give it all up to come follow you. I had a totally different picture of what it was supposed to look like going to Africa and serving the Lord. I didn't think that he would have me laying in a hospital, useless. And as I'm there laying in bed, I began to contemplate my life and I began to contemplate what was going to happen if, if God healed me, how I thought maybe I'm not so committed. Maybe this isn't the right choice for me. Maybe if I make it through this, I'm just going to go back to what I was doing before. Maybe I don't want to walk with the Lord. And as I was there and I was having these thoughts, I was being attacked by the enemy. My friend comes and kneels beside the bed. We had gone there with five people, my best friend and and four others. And and he, he quotes Luke chapter 9 to me. I'd like you to turn there. Luke chapter 9, towards the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 says, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. As for you, go proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that right there is what my friend quoted to me as I was laying on the hospital bed. No man having put his 
hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that cut to the heart. It cut to the heart and I realized, you're right. Lord, you're right. I can't look back. I've put my hand to the plow and I can't look back. So you know when Jesus went to call his disciples, it says that he went and he walked by the Sea of Galilee and he saw two fishermen in the boat. And he called to them and he said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the scripture tells us that immediately they dropped their nets and they left the boat and they followed him. And he went and he called to two others and said, come follow me. And immediately they left their boat and their father and they came and they followed him. Many of us may have never made a decision like that. Right? A lot of people are just born into the faith. A lot of people come into the faith and don't, you, you, you haven't really left anything. It's just kind of something you're born into. And so I'd ask you today, is there anything that you have given up to follow the Lord? Is there anything in your life that you have given up to follow the Lord? Or is there anything that he is pressing in your heart now that needs, needs to be given up to come and follow him and be his disciple? I'd like you to turn with me, and we're going to stay in this passage for a little while. It's... Uh, John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 35. In John 6, 35, Jesus is out and he's, he's teaching the multitudes and there's many people listening to him, some disciples, some not. And Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, and I do not do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but I will raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And I want you to notice here that in the crowd, in verse 41, it says, So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me except the father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that no one, that the one may eat of it and may not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Here's where things get interesting. Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds upon my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. 
Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And in verse 60, when many of his disciples, many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, but the flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. You see the words of Jesus. Many times, things that are spoken might be hard to receive. Did you notice here in verse 66, John 6, 6, 6, many of his disciples turned away. From that point on. And the reality is the church in America is maybe filled with all different types of disciples. You know, I was asked the question one time, I was with a couple friends and, and uh, this gentleman at the bar who was a little less than sober heard us having a conversation. And uh, we were talking about the Bible. And he leans over and he says, how many disciples did Jesus have? <laughs> and on our first thought, we're like, well, 12, right? We didn't say that. But a buddy of mine was like, well, there was a lot, you know. But when I ask the question, how many disciples did Jesus have? I think typically we, we immediately go to 12. But then we realize, no, no, there was 72. He sent out 72. But then we know that there was a multitude, Right? And then we know that when he died and resurrected, he appeared to over 500 people. But right here in John 6, 66, it says that from this point on, many of his disciples turned away and no longer, no longer followed him. Right? And one of the things about moving from California to Tennessee is, you know, in, in California, church was not a real big thing. And when it was a big thing, it was a mega church, right? You typically didn't have a church like Rock Valley. You either don't have a church or you're a mega church. And the consensus was not go therefore, it was grow therefore. And the whole, the whole idea of church is to grow into a bigger congregation and a bigger building. We moved to Tennessee, it's kind of the opposite. There's, there's a lot of small churches, literally a church on every corner, right? And uh, most of them Sunday-keeping churches, which is fine, you know? That's where we started. God got a hold of us and brought us into Rock Valley and, and grew us. But when we moved to Tennessee, it, it was ripping my children out of what we had in California with Rock Valley you see, my children were, were raised in Rock Valley. They were discipled in Rock Valley. That's where they were nurtured. We began keeping the feasts with that church. And about two years before we left Rock Valley, we began having um, fellowships at, at different homes where we would just get together and we would have worship and prayer. And it was a beautiful thing. And I cannot tell you how much spiritual growth we began to see in our family and the other families as we would join together 
And we would just have nights of worship where we would go till two or three in the morning with someone on the piano and someone praying and just worshiping God. And right in the midst of all of this, God says, William, I want you to take your family and pull them out of here. And I'm going to go plant you 2,500 miles away where you know nobody, where you have nothing. And I remember one of my good friends at this worship night, he, he was upset that we were leaving, but we were certain that God was calling us to go. And he nudges me and he says, you want to leave this? Like, do you realize that you're leaving this? And I said, yes, I do. And no, I don't want to leave it. But I have to because God is calling us to do something. So we get to Tennessee and we start church hopping, trying to figure out where we're supposed to be. And we can't find it, right? I'm sorry, but you just can't duplicate Rock Valley. <laughs> it's, uh, you guys are doing a good job here. But we've been around to other churches and, and we just can't find it. So finally, God kind of settles us between these two congregations. And one of them is a Seventh-day Church of God. And the other one is an SDA church. I knew nothing about the SDAs, just a very rough idea of what they're about. So we, we went to the SDA church once. They, they welcomed us in, but I knew there was a lot of differences there in our beliefs. But there were some kids there, just a couple kids, that had been praying that God would show them another way. Kind of like how this congregation started. That there was just a small group of God's people, a small group of disciples who said, we know there's something more. Father, we know there's something more. And this, this group of young kids were praying, but you see, my children didn't know that. My children were depressed. They were like, God, why did you rip us out of everything that we had? And we were growing and we had friends and we were serving you and we were worshiping and life was awesome. And why did you rip us out of that and bring us here? And my wife and I would tell our children, you know, he brought us here because he has a work for us to do. And we don't know what that is yet. But he's going to use us. He's going to use us. I said, he, he gave me this vision that we are like these little flames. And he just took this fire and he took this flame and he went and set it over here so we can start, we can start fires in other places. And I shared this with my daughter. And then I told my daughter, you know, I feel like God is, is telling me that we need to hold a worship night at our house and invite some of the people that we've met. She said, Dad, I feel that too. So they presented it to this, to this group, to these young kids. And uh, last week for the first time, we had a group of these, of these kids, and actually one of the adults from this SDA church came over to our house. And they had no idea what this was going to look like. We had a little bit of food, a little bit of fellowship. And then my son got on the piano. And he began to play some worship songs. And we began to sing, and we began to worship. And you should have seen the barriers and the walls come down with this group. And you should have seen the light that came into their faces. They had been praying for this. They didn't even know what they were looking for. They didn't even know what they were seeking. But the fact that they were seeking something. God says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. God will move somebody across the country to come and reach you if you're asking him. But many times we have not because we ask not. So this young man sends a text message, and it was the most beautiful thing the next day to my daughter and my son. And uh, I can't quote it verbatim, but it was something to the effect of, um, thank you guys so much. You have no idea what this means to us. We have never experienced God in a way like this before. We have never met people who are so filled with the Spirit of God. We, we didn't even know what this looked like. And he says, we, we had been feeling that God was wanting us to start something. 
And we felt like it was needed to be separate from our congregation. And I think this is it. And so we opened our home, and we're going to start doing a weekly worship night at our home with these kids. And we're, we're hoping that the fire will grow with this youth. And we're hoping to make disciples of people who have been in the church their whole life. Because you know you can be in the church your entire life. And you can be one of the disciples who when you hear the wrong thing, you just turn away and you don't follow him anymore. So we need to make disciples not like the, the multitude, but we need to make disciples like the twelve. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to go um, towards the end of the chapter in verse 24, but what I'd like to point out here is Matthew chapter 7 in general. If you want to know how we should be living as disciples, if you want to know what you should be learning and practicing in your life, um, read Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, 24, he says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came. And the winds blew and they beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And so ask yourself, number one, are you hearing the words of Jesus? Number two, are you doing them? Because if you hear them and you do them, then it doesn't matter what comes your way in life, God is going to allow you to stand the storms. God is going to be with you in the trials. He promises that for his people, we will have persecution. All who live godly will suffer persecution. And he has promised us tribulation. But if you live your life by the red letters the words of Jesus Christ. You will never fall. And this is the message that we have to bring out to the world. This is the message that a lot of the church doesn't even follow. We hear it and we don't do it. We hear it and we don't do it. But we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. So I leave you with the encouragement, if you've never done a red letter study, to just go through the scriptures, and maybe you don't have a red letter Bible, I don't have a red letter Bible, read the red letters, and as you read the teachings of Jesus Christ, the one we claim to follow, every time you come across something that strikes you, ask yourself, am I being obedient to this? When he says, when you go to bring your gift before the altar, and there you realize that your brother has something against you, first go and be reconciled with your brother, then come bring your gift. That isn't a suggestion. It's a command. It's a command. When he says, husbands, love your wives, like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, it's not a suggestion. When he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, it's not a suggestion. And you see, I, I use these examples because these are all things that I had to learn as a disciple of Jesus Christ. These are all things that I had to come to terms with, and I had to say, I am either a follower of Christ or I'm not. Because we can be hearers of the word only. If we're not doing it, we are deceiving ourselves. 
So I believe that there are a lot of disciples in here whose desire and heart is to do what he said. And I would encourage everyone here, be a light to your neighbors. Be a light in the workplace. We have been given the words of life. There is nothing that can stand against the principles of God and the teachings of Jesus Christ. There is nothing that can overcome you. There is nothing that can defeat you. There is nothing that can tear your family apart. There is nothing that can tear your children from you. If you stand upon the words of Jesus Christ and if you are building your life upon the rock. Be blessed. I look forward to more fellowship with y'all. And uh, let me end this with prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for your words of life. And I ask, Father, that you impart to everyone here um, whatever it is that they need to take away from this, Father. And that as we read and as we continue to pursue you, Father, uh, that we will be doers of your word and not hearers only. Father, we desire to be true disciples and to not only be disciples who learn, but disciples who teach and shine the light, Father, everywhere we go. We give you glory, honor, and praise. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.